my first mediation um, <laughs> was uh, not too long after I opened my business and I was thankful to have it. Spent a lot of time talking on one side with the plaintiff and I felt like they were going to be reasonable. And the attorney for the city said, we're not, we're not putting any money on the table. <laughs> at mediation. Wonderful. <laughs> at mediation. Welcome to The Defense Never Rests with Morgan and Akins, your monthly dose of uncommon sense about all things legal and some that are not. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Defense Never Rests. I'm your host, Megan Henry, and today I'm joined by Jason Rosen, who he's here to talk about mediation. I can't get enough of these mediation podcasts because every time I talk to a new mediator, I learn, you know, a new perspective and just a new view on, you know, how they approach mediations and what they look for. Uh, so really, you're going to keep hearing them because I, I, I like to, to do these mediation uh, podcasts. So with that said, let me bring him in. Good afternoon, Jason. Thanks so much for joining the Defense Never Rest today. How are you? Great, Megan. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, it's a beautiful day. Uh, it's been, we've, I'm in New Jersey and we've had like a long uh, like heat wave. And finally today it's like 80 and no humidity. So it's beautiful. How about yourself? That's fantastic. Uh, I'm in Seattle. Uh, and last month we had the highest temperatures we've ever mm -hmm. had. Um, sure did. And, and that was pretty <laughs> miserable. But now we're back to our, our perfect Seattle summer weather. 75 and sunny and and hopefully we'll have that for several weeks and uh and no smoke from the forest fires yeah, which is um also key i was just going to ask that if you you had if you've been affected by that um not so far this year the wind's blowing the right direction there's there's plenty of fires um but the smoke is uh ha hasn't come this way yet well Believe it or not, it, it's come this way. Um, the past two days, it was really hazy here, and it, it was because the smoke had had traveled like across the country. So, which I was like amazed about. That's right. I, I saw that in the news. So, yeah, that it, it, it is. It's amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. I think like my my husband had emailed me one day when he was at work, and he's like, "Is it hazy?" I was like, "I don't know. I guess it's overcast." But <laughs> but then I went outside. I'm like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> this is not normal." <laughs> Yeah, I guess so, the, I guess the fire in Oregon is 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 fairly fairly large and pretty devastating. So hopefully, oh, it, it can uh, you know be contained at some point. They they say it's it's going to take either uh, rain or snow. Like they can't do it uh, with with firefighting. Yeah. So yeah, oh that's uh, terrible. Hope, yeah, ho hopefully it's not too 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 devastating for for structures and people and so forth. Yeah, I know. Um, on that note. Uh, <laughs> Let's change gears. So, you know, you're here to talk about mediations and, um, you know, doing online mediations and early mediations. But before we get into the meat of that, I want to talk about you um, and, you know, how you got where you are today. Um, and, you know, we, I, I did a little looking at your LinkedIn profile, and I think you graduated college with a theater major. I did. So how, how does one graduate with a theater major and then end up going to law school? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, growing up, you know, I was involved in theater. I mean, I, just more like the class clown, um, uh, more more comedy than 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 drama, so to speak. But um, uh, my dad's an attorney, and I was always going to be either an actor or a lawyer. <laughs> and um, after doing theater in in college or graduating with a with a drama major. Um, I didn't want to go to LA and, and be a starving waiter. So um, took a couple of years and went to law school. Um, so went with plan B. Um, happy that I did. Um, wouldn't want to do it any other way. And um, you know, went to Willamette Law School down in Oregon. And when um, I was there, they were just implementing a, an ADR program, um, which I participated in. And so uh, during law school, I got a certificate in ADR, um, you know, which was fantastic. And I think planted the seed um, back then that at some point um, I'd like to be a mediator. And, and um, so that, that, that's led me to here. Well, so what, interesting is it, did you, did you try to pursue acting for a short amount of time and was like, oh, this isn't working out. I'm just going to go to plan B. Or did you just decide when you graduated, like, hmm, that's probably, probably just going to go to plan B. Uh, no, it was, it was plan B. It was, bar, it was, I pursued bartending and, and plan B law school. <laughs> now during your, after law school, did you, you work in private practice? Um, I did. Okay. Were you a litigator? 
So uh, yeah, I was, I did um, insurance defense for a number of years, um, uh, including up until about five years ago when I started um, my own firm. Um, and, um, you know, that, that was tough. It was, it was a great firm. I love the people that I worked with, um, you know, love the work that we did, um, but realized that, you know, my sort of highest and best use was going to be as a mediator and, and not as a litigator. And so, um, you know, once I made that decision, it was, it was difficult to leave all those, you know, fantastic people. I was a partner at, at a, at a small firm here in Seattle and, and, um, you know, worked with wonderful people that, um, you know, sort of, for, for, for me, it was, it was the right decision, even though it was difficult. Now, I, I can't help but think this though, but having, you know, the theatrical background, did you feel like that helped you in like going to trial? Cause you're, you know, you're, you're, you're accustomed to putting on the show and you're, you feel very comfortable in that, that role. Did, did it really help you? Um, I think it, it definitely helped, um, uh, in, yeah, it just, in, in, in dealing with people more so than, um, putting on trial. I mean, I'm somewhat introverted, which I think is maybe one reason why I pursued law as opposed to, to acting, um, mm -hmm. maybe realize that being up on stage, um, wasn't going to be, you know, um, the most comfortable thing for me. So, um, you know, but but all of that training and that background and sort of the um, improvisation and um, ability to sort of adapt and you know sort of shift gears and change characters yeah. and and meet people where they're at um, that certainly helped. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, like the, I mean, improv, you you have to try to just anticipate what someone's going to say, and then they could say something totally different. So, you know, if that happens a lot at depositions and, and in trial that you, you don't know what your witness is going to say. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's really good training to, for that role. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, we, we are as attorneys on stage a lot, whether it's, you know, in trial or in deposition. And so, you know, I think that background certainly helped. And also, I think from the remembering lines portion. I mean, you're probably really good at remembering very specifics of like black letter law or whatever, you know, certain things that you can recite. Like that's something I always struggle with. I remember when I was like young, like trying to remember certain parts of like the rules of evidence, you know, I, I had a harder time committing that to memory. And if you're an actor, that's part of, you know, it's part of your, your trait. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. I mean, in some respects, yes. Um, but when you focus on the improv too, um, you know, I think maybe I focused on the improv because I wasn't great at remembering, right? And it's it's easier to sort of um, uh, wing it and uh, mm -hmm. be creative and, and come up with things off the cuff as opposed to, um, you know, put, putting things down to rote memory and going off of the script. I mean, let's put it this way. I, don't, I wasn't ever going to be a, a Shakespearean uh, actor. Well, well, and it's good that you found the path that works, works well for you. And I mean, that, I think that's the beauty of being an attorney is that you can come from every different path imaginable and still end up here. And those prior, you know, those traits really help feed to the type of attorney you are and like what, what, you know, you're able to focus on. Like for me, you know, numbers and math and logic games were always like a real strong suit for me. Um, because I, I, I was a science major and I majored in math and, but like most attorneys are like, oh God, I, I'm like math, I can't do math. But that type of logical thinking really like lend, it, lend well, especially for like the LSAT. Like that was just a, it was a game for me. And others were like, oh, that was the worst part of the test. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that actually. I, I seem to do well in, in math and, um, but you know, you're right. You can um, branch off of, you know, uh, into so many different areas um, from law school. And that was one of the things that, um, you know, I told myself when I was deciding, am I going to be an actor? Or am I going to be an attorney? Um, you know, you can always do acting on some level in some form, um, you know, either, um, you know, earlier or, or later in life. Um, and I had great respect for those that I saw in law school um, that were a little later in their careers, but I didn't want to be one of those persons that was going to law school um later you know after trying to you know act and if it if yeah. that didn't work out so i didn't want that to be plan b 
Yeah. And I, I respect that. I remember um, in law school, there were a few people who were doctors and had been practicing th- physicians for some time and going back to law school. And I, I had so much respect for them because I'm like, you really went through the long haul of becoming all that work to become a doctor. I think one of them was a surgeon even. And now you're going back to law school. You're going back to do more. Um, I had so much respect for them, but it was definitely not something I would want to do after you know committing to a career and then just being like, oh, let's let's pick something else up along the way. Although now I think they're both very successful um, medical malpractice attorneys. So I guess maybe they had a plan. All right. Along. Well, I, no, I, I, I agree a hundred percent. And, you know, I'm thankful that mediating was a natural transition mm-hmm. um, from litigating. And, you know, I've certainly done um, quite a bit of training in, in mediation, but, um, you know, to not have to go back and do, you know, two or three years specifically just yeah. to be certified or qualified um, to mediate, um, you know, that I'm, I'm certainly grateful for that. Yeah. Um, and before we, we jump into your career change into mediation before I forget, I want to ask, so do you, are you, do you, are you able to do any acting on the side now? Like, do you do any local, local stuff or is it something that's just in your past? This is it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I haven't. Um, uh, I, I did a, a commercial several years ago, um, Mm -hmm. but I haven't really been pursuing it. Anything that we would know? (laughs) Uh, It was a national commercial for Snapper Lawnmowers. Oh, wow. Um, That's great. So, um, you know, people may have seen them, but this was, you know, uh, 20 years ago. Oh, (laughs) so, so you work in litigation for several years and, and how do you come to make the transition over to doing, to doing private mediations yourself? Sure. well, like I said, the, the seed was always planted, um, and ADR I think was always um, sort of, um, you know, in my veins or you know in the back of my mind. Um, I sort of um, practiced with an eye towards you know finding pragmatic solutions, even though you know I know I had to represent one side um, in in the in the dispute, um, but you know, even when I was practicing and, and we'd be in mediation, I was focusing more on what the mediator was doing as well as, you know, what was going on with the case and our particular client. And, and I knew that that was something that I was going to want to pursue. Um, and, you know, when I got to the point where I felt um, that I had, you know, enough ex- experience and enough connections and, and was ready to do that, um, you know, had, had to make the decision, can I do it? in the context of practicing at my firm and sort of, you know, try and do it part-time um, and decided that at a firm where it was really primarily insurance defense and we did a lot of um, municipal defense and representing police departments and, and police officers um, that, you know, it, it wasn't, it, it probably wasn't gonna be a good idea and yeah. it was gonna be difficult to get cases if I was so closely affiliated with that mm-hmm. firm. Um, and so um, I'm still great friends with um, everybody there. And um, when I decided to, to leave, as I was saying, it was, it was a difficult decision because we had such great relationships. But, um, you know, so, but I decided to and started my own firm and I rented uh, an office in the same building as them. And, and in the past, I've used their conference rooms to conduct mediations and suspect if we go back to in-person mediations, I'll, I'll do so and again. It's a, it was a great space down on, on Lake Union in Seattle. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's calm, it's serene, it's a great setting conducive to, to um, you know, um, a good mindset for negotiating, <laughs> yeah. which I think is, is important for, for mediations. Um, and but so that's you know maybe the, the the long answer to your question of sort of how that evolution took place. Well, and I think like when people make career changes like that, they are often greeted with open arms because it's not like you're going to you know a, a rival firm or you're moving somewhere to do some, the same thing someplace else. When you're you know, I think when you go in house or you, you do something like that, you change to you know open up your own mediation practice. I think that people respect that choice, um, that you're making like a, a career pivot. Um, and also like, think about it, like you mediate with people that you, you know, and you trust. So now you're, you have your former colleagues at your prior firm that probably like, Oh, 
you know, we would love, you know, we know Jason, we'd love to mediate with him and they recommend you to other people. So it's a great way to help you grow your own business. No, that's, you're exactly right. I mean, you know, they understood, um, they were supportive. They've been supportive. Um, in fact, recently I have mediated a couple of cases with them. You know, I think that we had to have some, some time go by before, <laughs> before um, anyone but, would agree know, to mean, it. <laughs> if, if they want to use me and if the other side is open to using me, knowing the, the relationship and the history, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So, yeah. And I imagine that was probably one of the, one of the challenges though, or starting out is you have to grow clientele. You have to have people begin to trust you and know that, you know, that you're good at your job. And it, at the very beginning, I'm sure it's, it's hard to like start, you know, getting the momentum going. Did you have those challenges at first? Absolutely. And, and I'm, I don't know that I'm done with all of those challenges, but I mean, when I opened my firm, um, I was litigating as well as mediating. Um, you know, now I, I, you know, I'm taking mediation cases exclusively. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's, you know, um, a colleague recently said building a mediation practice is one client at a time, one relationship at a time. Um, and building that trust and, you know, getting, um, you know, sort of enough people in the community that, that know you and are, and are comfortable with you and, yeah. and will refer you that, um, you know, it sort of, um, you know, grows incrementally. Yeah. And it's, you know, there is, a I believe, I would expect a fair amount of pressure on you to, especially at the beginning but always, because you have a reputation to like, make sure you're really getting good results and you're, you know, you know, making people happy. So then they'll recommend you. Yeah, absolutely. Whether you get a settlement or not, you want people to be comfortable with the process and feel that it went well. Exactly. Um, you know, it was uh, a funny story. Um, my first mediation um, <laughs> was uh, not too long after I opened my business and I was thankful to have it. And um, it was going to be a great case. It was a uh, police excessive force claim and um, spent a lot of time talking on one side with the plaintiff and I felt like they were going to be reasonable and and went into the defense room and um, the attorney for the city said we're not we're not putting any money on the table <laughs> at mediation wonderful at mediation <laughs> and, and you know I mean did, it, did they in, come in, for the snacks <laughs> no yeah right right it was at their office <laughs> I don't think so. And there, you know, there's, there's like seven people in there, the officer and a risk manager and city manager and, and uh, somebody from the insurance company. And, um, and I think, you know, mediation um, is mandatory in those types of claims at that time. Um, so I think they had to do their, do that to check the box, but it would have been helpful, I think, to know that beforehand. But, yeah. you know, so I can never say I've settled hundred percent of my cases, unfortunately, <laughs> because that one didn't settle. And, and you know, I think, to, to, to the defense's credit, they got it right. They got a defense verdict from what I understand. So, you know, they were, they were on, on, on good footing and in good faith. Um, but then why did they come? That was a little surprising. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I understand coming to mediation and maybe not having the authority, enough authority to get the case done, but coming and having nothing, like why, why agree to begin with? I, I, I can imagine that just, it, it does not, sit well with the other party if you come in you're like oh yeah i'm here but i have zero dollars to give well that, that that's exactly right and and i did learn a lot from that one and i don't know that i would have done everything i mean i would have probably done things differently and had had a, a more candid conversation with defense counsel earlier you know which is what i do now i try and talk with the parties now um as as far in advance of the mediation as i possibly can to make sure um everything that needs to be done um for conducive settlement discussions is, is being done or has been done. Um, you know, and in that case, that, that question certainly, you know, that, that conversation would have involved, you know, um, do you have some authority or, you know, how are you going to be coming into this? And if they had said, we're not going to off, be offering anything, you know, perhaps we could have avoided everybody getting together and, and met the requirements for a mediation without having to go through all the pomp and circumstance. Yeah. And, you know, you're the second person I've talked to that, or second mediator I've talked to that does have that pre-mediation discussion. Um, and I have to say, that's not something I've, I've experienced. And I think it makes so much sense. Um, it, one, not only does it get the process started earlier, 
Um, but you kind of remove some of the initial song and dance that you have at the beginning of the mediation that you don't really get anywhere for that first like 45 minutes. <laughs> you know, you come in kind of like already knowing where to start and you use your time very efficiently. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, when I was practicing, it was rare that we would have those conversations with the mediator in advance. Um, I think the times that we did, it was certainly helpful. But then when I was training, um, that was emphasized. And, um, you know, I have found um, not only is it extremely welcomed um, by the parties, um, and it's usually with the attorneys, um, extremely welcomed, but it's extremely beneficial to the process. And um, does allow for things to, you know, perhaps be discussed that um, may be necessary or helpful to know going in. Um, um, things may need to get done. Sometimes those conversations lead to continuing the mediation um, to allow for additional discovery or exchange of information, um, you know, which you'd certainly rather know beforehand than, you know, morning of. Yes. Um, and, and, and yeah, it definitely allows you to hit the ground running and provides a lot of insight to me as to where the parties um, are coming from heading into the, into the mediation. Yeah. I, I, like, I couldn't agree more. Like I, I recently had a mediation that, you know, we had some negotiations ahead of time. Um, and I think it would have sped up the process if we had that initial discussion, just even I had a one-on-one -on -one with a mediator, they had a one-on-one -on -one mediator. And I could be like, look, this is where they are. This is where we are. These are the main issues. Even though it's all in my memo, I can pinpoint you to like what I think the issues are. They can pinpoint them to what the issues are. And it saves the mediator's time getting ready. And then we would save, you know, a 45 minutes walking in the door. Um, and I mean, there's not, I think there's nothing clients hate more than seeing like time just tick by at a mediation and not much happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, occasionally with those discussions, you can eliminate the need for the mediation session altogether. I mean, I've had cases resolve where, you know, we started the discussions a few days ahead of time or, or a couple of weeks ahead of time. And, um, you know, you can advance the process and advance the negotiations and, you know, through phone calls and emails, et cetera, um, get a case resolved. Yeah. And that's what I was going to go with that. Like with, with this new thing that we're, we're all doing all these online mediations, which I, I, I think have, are good and not good. Like I have, I have, opposing views on them. But when you bring up that, that you, you eliminate the need of the actual sit down mediation session, I do think there is a good, there are cases that suits well for that. You don't have to, okay, we have mediation on, you know, July 22nd at 10 AM, we are, we're going to have a mediation and you go back and forth, back and forth. Like may, maybe it's better that you just, you have your neutral party who, you know, over the course of a week, you know, works it out back and forth with, you know, with, with the parties and gets it done that way. I agree a hundred percent. Um, I don't know how it is where you are, but here in, in Washington, um, with the types of cases that I mediate, um, it's very rare, um, that the parties are ever in the same room. Um, we don't do opening statements. Um, and so in reality, you know, the, the mediations typically are asynchronous. It's, you know, it's me talking with the parties and conveying the message to the other side. The parties are never talking directly to one another. Oh, yeah. um, and so, um, you know, in some respects, yeah, you can you can convey the same messages and have the same conversations, you know, either by phone or by email, et cetera. Now, I think, you know, there, there is a benefit um, to, um, you know, being face to face, if you will, or camera to camera. Um, you know, with, with the plaintiff and the plaintiff attorney to some extent. Um, but that doesn't, you know, even mean that you have to uh, do that for the entire, you know, full day mediation. I mean, perhaps you, you, you meet them, you get a sense of where they're coming from. Um, and then as the, you know, mediation sort of progresses into, um, you know, money negotiations, um, you know, that can be done in, in, in other ways through, um, you know, telephone calls, emails, et cetera. Um, so there is, there's much more flexibility um, with taking things online, whether it's shorter Zoom sessions, no Zoom sessions, a combination of, you know, different medium, what have you. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I remember being in 
like day long mediations and that, you know, the, the, the mediator, mediator would encourage you not to leave. You want, want all the parties to stay in the building, you know, not go any for lunch, anywhere for lunch. And the, the philosophy being, you know, that could be very distracting. Um, and at the time, that's just kind of how before COVID, that's kind of how it all was, was done. Uh, but sometimes it'd be very frustrating for attorneys and clients because it would seem to be 5.30, then suddenly things start to happen at 5.30, you know, at night. And what, what were we doing all day, <laughs> you know? So I think, stre- and, and maybe there's cases that, that that is the best place for that to be. But I think for the majority of cases, it, it works well, like how how you're you're talking about that, you know, it's you know, a back and forth and maybe not just a sit down, you know, in one place at one time, you know, beat it out type session. I think you have to do the dance. So a little bit, sure. Right. Um, so um, you, you, you can't necessarily say, you know, we should have gotten to the, the point um, uh, that we got to at 530 at 1030 in the morning. Why did we have to do all of that? Um, but I think you're absolutely right. It, it doesn't have to take place, um, you know, in, you know, a confined room for, you know, X number of time, you know, in, you know, um, in, in a single chunk. Um, yeah. Now, I don't know why that mediator didn't want you to go to lunch. You got it. You got to <laughs> I hope they brought lunch in in that case, yeah. but uh, <laughs> always bring lunch in. There's always lots of snacks and candy and stuff, but <laughs> I know I think that's one thing that people miss about in person. And, and I've actually thought of if, if things stay online, um, I may put some care packages together to send out to people to make sure that they've got some snacks and, and so forth, um, you know, so that they're still getting that benefit. Yeah, I like that. Send care packages. You, you should send wine. That will get everything done quickly <laughs> for the end. <laughs> For the end. Yeah, Absolutely. for the end. Yeah, you don't want to sidetrack it too yeah, early. That's exactly right. Um, it, so- yeah, one of the other benefits of, of online mediation is um, you can you can access a wider range of, of mediators, um, you know, including a more diverse range because you can mediate with somebody who's located basically anywhere in the world. And, and um, you know, if you've got a particular need, um, for a certain type of mediator in your case, you know, now it, it opens up the ballpark and you, you mentioned wine. Um, and, and in, in that vein, um, I, I did a, I did a wine, an online wine tasting for a, for a CLM event. And, and in, in doing some research for that, um, I discovered that there's over 10,000 types of wine grapes, you know, but we only think of, of the Cabernets and the yeah. Merlots, et cetera, you know, the, 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 the four or five or six. And that I, I, I analogize that to mediators. You know, everybody's got their, their three or four go-to mediators that they like to use, their Cabernet mediators, mm-hmm. if you will. But, you know, there's, there's lots of great mediators out there. Um, I don't know if there's, you know, I don't know if there are 10,000, but there probably are. There are probably more, but, oh, sure. but there's as many mediators as there are different varieties of wine grapes. And I'd encourage people to, you know, um, you know, look to using other folks and, and finding people who are, who are right for a case, not just right, because, you know, they're, they're familiar with, 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 um, you know, with them in particular. And I I think that's a great, great point there too. Although I do think there is something to be said about having a mediator who understands your particular venue and the challenges that you may face in that venue. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's a, like a, a, a tipping scale, you know, I think there's some cases I, I wouldn't be concerned about using a mediator in a totally different, um, jurisdiction, but then I want to, would want to make sure they understood my jurisdiction and what kind of impact that could have on, on the case and the value of the case. Absolutely. hundred percent. You know, I encourage people to, um, touch base with a mediator that they you know either aren't familiar with to, 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 you know, ask them how they might be able to help, whether they might be right for the case. Hopefully they're candid. Um, you know, um, you know, I, I'm certainly um, happy when people contact me in that regard and I'm open to that. And if a case isn't right, you know, uh, I'll, um, you know, let somebody know and maybe help them find, uh, you know, somebody who might be better suited. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, absolutely. You want, you want to be comfortable with whomever you're using. That's, you know, primarily. Yeah, because I, I think about like, so you have like Philadelphia, that's known to be like a very hard venue or Miami or something like that. And, but say you get a mediator from, I don't know, 
middle of the middle of the country, like they might not have the same appreciation for the, you know, the Miami or the Philadelphia or Queens, New York type venue. So you just need to be careful, I think, of that and know, like know where you're com- know where they're coming from before you go outside your comfort zone, so to speak. No, that's exactly right. But there certainly are some specialized mediators out there, yeah. you know, particular, you know, you know, big, big, big case mediators who, you know, are now um, available to work from the, the comfort of their home, as opposed to, you know, having to fly across the country for a, yeah. for a full day mediation. Absolutely. And that, and that works both ways too. It's, it's great. You know, um, another benefit of online mediation is um, adjusters who might be um, in another region don't have to spend three days uh, traveling for a, for a one day mediation. And, and, you know, so they save the time and the cost. And I know the insurance companies really appreciate that aspect of, of online mediation. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I, as much as, you know, I, I like have, having that time with, with my client in the room, you know, to save them the travel time and cost, you know, it, it is so beneficial. And I just think back to like, I remember having a mediation that was, you know, in November and Philadelphia had this like fluke, you know, three inch, two inch snowstorm, but they grounded all the planes and then my, my client couldn't get back to, you know, where he was coming from. I'm like, what a nightmare, you know, and thankfully the case got resolved. So it wasn't all for naught, but it would be much, I think, preferred at, had he been able to attend, you know, virtually. And, and I agree, like the video attendance, I think is better than the phone attendance. Cause I do like my clients to be there and hear what's going with the mediator saying and be part of the process versus me calling them during the process, but having them on, you know, being able to do it virtually, I think is, it just opens a lot of doors and makes it easier for everyone involved. No, that's exactly right. I mean, plaintiffs, um, when they're doing it from home, they're in a more comfortable environment. Um, which can certainly aid the process. They don't have to, you know, deal with with driving downtown, which you know a lot of people aren't comfortable with if they're coming from the suburbs and, you know, paying yeah. for parking and being in a busy area and standing up in a skyscraper and, <laughs> you know, watching the traffic on the freeway and wondering how long it's going to take to get home. I mean, they're, you know, they're home. They're comfortable. They can give a hundred percent, you know, to to yeah. to what's going on. Um, and, and I think that's that's been helpful as well. And you know, and, you know, candidly, I think attorneys have said one benefit of online is, um, you know, they don't have to spend a whole day um, in a room with a client, you know, sort of entertaining them and, and you know, um, filling the time when the mediator isn't in the room with, with small talk, et cetera. Instead, they can just put the computer on, on, uh, on mute and work on something else, et cetera. And, and um, you know, so I think that's another benefit. Yeah. And slightly off course, I see this similar benefit to like court appearances. Now that we're moving to some court appearances being virtual, you know, the ones that, you know, you would have normally have to drive an hour, wait, you know, 25 minutes for a, you know, three minute, you know, call. And now that a lot of the judges are moving those online, it's just such a, like a time and money saver that I hope those types of events stay that way. Like there is no need for it to have a hundred attorneys in the room waiting for a case to be called on the calendar. I think we could just do away from it across the board. No, that, 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 I mean, that, that's exactly right. You know, um, it was some some necessity breeds invention or or what have you. And I think we're finding out that, that um, there's a lot of benefits to doing things um, a little bit differently. And I was just talking with a plaintiff attorney friend of mine here who says he loves doing um, depositions online. And, you know, we'll look to do that more so going forward. I agree. I mean, I think there are challenges, though, to doing the depositions online. Like from an exhibit standpoint, I much prefer if I to be in the room with the plaintiff to show them the exhibits and, you know, kind of feel the the feel the mood of the room and how things shift during that. Um, it also just makes it easier to see what they're marking and, you know, that sort of thing. But there's some witnesses that you know, maybe your witness is halfway across the state and, you know, they have childcare issues and they don't have transportation and, you know, to be able to throw out the option that is now readily available that no, no, like we can send someone to you and you, or, you know, we can send you a link and then we'll have a court reporter and you don't need to travel. Um, it just makes some of that stuff so much easier. That's exactly right. We've got the flexibility now and, and, and the choices and, 
you know, uh, now now I'm not going to let adjusters uh, not participate in mediations because I know that I can uh, I can have a room with a laptop set up just for them to to uh, talk with them directly. Yes. Or, so, or or we can or we can bring them into the room with defense counsel. But there have to be some some cases or some occasions that you you still th- prefer that that matter to be in person. You know, th- there has to be some instances that you know it does serve a greater benefit to, to have it be in person. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. Um, certainly, um, you know, uh, you know, higher, um, not higher conflict cases, but, but cases of, um, uh, higher emotion, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, death cases, um, things where you really want to spend some time with somebody and, and not, you know, sort of miss cues, et cetera, and, and make sure that, you know, um, people understand that you're fully present, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's all kinds of cases where I think, you know, in-person will be um, beneficial. Yeah, um, so I agree. We're, we're not, we're not, we're, we're not going to go 100% um, remote and, um, you know, a- absolutely. Yeah, I I agree. I think there's a, some some scenarios that it, you know, so, some plant plaintiffs or claimants they they, I feel like want to be heard in a way that they they want someone to be there and hear and feel their feelings about w- what had happened to them. Um, so that just sometimes I think it's more effective, you know, when you're in person than having like a almost like it's not that things are. I feel like people are now adapting to connecting, you know, over the zoom format, but you still lose a little bit of that personal touch. So I think there, there, there's some cases that that's just necessary. Well, that, that, I mean, that, that's exactly right. And that's a great point and sort of reminds me that, you know, I think one key component of, um, you know, being effective in, in mediating and litigating, et cetera, is recognizing, um, you know, the, the, the relationships and the importance of the relationships and developing them, um, you know, uh, from, from the beginning, developing them well from the beginning, um, whether it's with opposing counsel or me with counsel and the parties as the mediator. Um, and, um, you know, that, recognizing that, I think, um, on, on each side, um, makes the ultimate makes the process um, go much smoother and and makes the ultimate outcome um, I think um, optimized or go smoother. Um, I mean that that's something that that's that's a point that I you know I think would raise um, you know to 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 parties to defense counsel and adjusters etc. Is is um, you know be cognizant of how you're relating to the other side from the mm-hmm. start. Um, you know, be likable, you know, you don't, um, maybe even be nice. Yeah. Um, but, um, you can express your position and that, you know, you might see your case differently than, than the other side sees their case without being antagonistic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in in a lot of cases, you know, I, I think, um, we default to being antagonistic or we assume that the other side is going to be difficult to deal with. And so we sort of take a, a defensive position from the get go. Um, and, and, and maybe, you know, I'm, I'm talking from experience. I certainly had, you know, when I was practicing, um, you know, a number of contentious cases and that's just sort of the nature of the beast. Right. Um, but I think if you step back and, and recognize in a lot of cases, both sides are trying to get to the same place. Um, you know, that, that can change the tone. And if you change the tone and try and come at things more collaboratively, um, you know, that, that, that can benefit, um, you know, the entire process, but you individually too, I mean, it can certainly make the process for you, um, much more, um, you know, pleasing if you, if you're not fighting with opposing counsel on, on every single issue, um, and talking early about how you might, um, you know, go through um, discovery, what you need, you know, go through and, um, 
uh, you know, do it in a, in a collaborative way, et cetera. Um, you know, I think that that certainly benefits you in the end. Um, yeah. And, and that's another reason I, I personally don't like the, the joint um, session that you, the beginning, you, you, you talk about your case and why your case is so wonderful. Um, Cause I just feel like all it does, especially for the, the plaintiff, I feel like all it does is get them immediately on the defensive and upset with the, uh, with the defendant defendants and it just starts on like a poor, poor footing. I would just rather, I mean, the mediator knows the issues. I don't think we need to throw it down the plaintiff's throat, how like not injured we think they are, you know, or how terrible we think their case is. Like, I, I don't think that gets us anywhere uh, besides a few steps back. No, that's, a, that's exactly right. I mean, that, that's sort of a, a, a microcosm of, of what I was trying to express in terms of the entire litigation, right? I mean, if, if you're fighting with the other side the entire time over everything, um, why would you expect to come to the mediation and have them, you know, be, be looking out for your best interests or be willing to perhaps compromise just a little bit if it's, if it's been contentious the entire time, whereas if it's been civil, um, you know, but, you know, you've respectfully disagreed on, on the positions, but you've explained to the other side, um, you know, why you feel the way you do and, and, you know, presented the evidence that you feel supports your position, um, you know, and you've, you've had a, a um, you know, cordial, um, um, you know, litigation up to that point. I think they're going to be more inclined to, you know, maybe want to compromise or even see things your way um, as opposed to ha it having been contentious. Yeah, I agree. So one thing I wanted to to bring up, though, because um, I think there's very diverging views on this issue is the on memos um, on the mediation statements and whether or not they should be confidential or, or not. I know there's some some mediators who feel that th they do not allow confidential memos. Uh, I personally prefer confidential memos because I feel like I can be more candid um, about what it is, our, the defendant's position in, in that case than I can be in a, a non-confidential memo, memo. But I, in your viewpoint, what do you, what do you think um, or what would you prefer to help get the case to resolution? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, uh, again, mediate your answer, right? It depends. <laughs> Well, that's a lawyer um, answer. <laughs> right. Um, but I mean, I certainly encourage um, sharing with the other party of the mediation brief. Um, but when we were practicing on the defense side, we often didn't. Um, and for those reasons, I think you can, you know, express um your positions to the mediator that you feel very strongly about, but you feel, you know, might be inflammatory to the other side. Um, and in that case, I think it makes sense to not give anything. If you're going to provide something to the other side, that's going to be counterproductive to the process and just incense them, um, you know, th then I would say, don't do that. Um, you know, I, I, I um, think if I, I, suggest doing, you know, two briefs, doing yeah. one that you can share with the other side. And then if there are things that you want to share with the mediator in private, you can do that. Um, you know, but I've often found even when the one side doesn't share the brief with the other side and you start going through it and you start talking to them, you know, there's very little in there, um, you know, that they wouldn't want to share with the other side. It's just a matter, you know, it's just sort of figuring out how it's done. I mean, right, that's one of the benefits of mediation is you can you can work with the mediator to help, you know, frame um, your viewpoint in a way that's going to be more palatable to the other side. Yeah. yeah. That you may not have thought of initially. Yeah, that's a good point. I've done I've done the two briefs before, um, and that that sounds tends to work work well too. Particularly, I think, or or I see more challenges is when you're doing like early mediations, like. Oh, even pre-litigation mediation, sometimes in those scenarios, you don't want to share your memo because you don't want to give away your theory or, or your, how you're looking at the, your defense that early in the case, because it might frame their, their cases to attack your defense before you've even started. Yeah, that's a great point. And I certainly appreciate, you know, a lot of times on the defense side, you're writing your brief 
um, for your client as much as you are um, for the mediator. Um, and you, you're also, you're, you have to be a, an advocate for your client's position. So, um, you know, that, that's part of the mediation process is, is understanding both sides' views. Um, you know, but, but I, I appreciate, you know, writing a strong, a strong, you know, sending a strong message um, to the mediator, um, at least initially, um, to outline your positions. And yeah. certainly not wanting to share it with the other side um, uh, too soon. And, and, and especially early when you're not sure whether you're going to have a good chance um, of resolving the case. Yeah. So and I wanted to talk about like early mediation. That was kind of my segue into early mediations. Because, um, you know, there's a lot of times that I, I'm a big fan of using them. You know, if I have a, a, a case that might be um, potentially very high exposure for my client or potentially high exposure, but maybe they don't have as much, much skin in the game for liability, but it's like a, a fatality or something like that, that I know is going to be very costly to defend. Um, those are ones I personally try to push into early mediation to see if, you know, we can try to resolve this before, you know, spending all these litigation costs um, to their benefit. But sometimes it doesn't work out <laughs> because sometimes they just want a lot of money that we're not willing to pay that early on. <laughs> So from your viewpoint, what, like, what do you see as good cases that are, you know, prime candidates for that early pre-litigation mediation? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, I think that in every case, um, you should look and consider whether um, an early resolution um, is possible and, and, and explore it, um, whether or not that's, you know, to the extent of taking it to a mediation or not may depend on, on what your evaluation turns up, but, um, you know, I, I think um, assuming that you're not going to be able to get something done or that um, you, you, you can't mediate until the case schedule says you mediate a month out from trial, um, you know, may, um, you know, hinder you from, from really, you know, getting rid of a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, and, um, Certainly cases, yes, where, where, where there's high exposure, where, you know, where liability is clear, um, where um, you're going to have, um, you know, um, significant defense costs, um, and, and maybe, you know, the, the damages aren't that significant, and maybe the, maybe the liability isn't that clear, but it's a, you know, the, the, uh, the cost of defending is going to significantly yeah. outweigh what the case should settle for. Um, certainly appropriate for early mediation. Um, and, um, you know, I think um, your colleague, uh, Patricia Baxter, um, has put together some, some materials that, that I think really um, synthesized a lot of what I saw and felt when I was, when I was practicing that, um, you know, oftentimes cases, um, um, you know, you should they sh you should explore resolution sooner um, than we often did. I mean, we yeah. had, you know, I, I, there's, there's a case I'll use it as an example. It was um, a, a it was a construction case. There was a a subcontractor who was a surveyor who was hired to um, do surveying on a on a tunnel digging machine, and so they had to determine where the tunnel was underground, and that's the only way that you could do it. Um, and the uh, the boring machine wound up a few feet off at the end of the tunnel and it caused some damages to the contractor and the contractor, um, you know, asserted a claim and, and um, early on, we looked at it and we went to mediation and um, the plaintiff was suggesting that there was, you know, $400,000 in, in, in damages and, um, you know, probably could have got that case settled for, you know, Two hundred and fifty or three hundred thousand dollars, but um, didn't didn't feel that there was enough information on um, you know to, to say that we were liable and needed to do more discovery. And you know, long story short, two years <laughs> later, and and you know, um, experts, very qualified experts with um, divergent opinions, um, um, you know, taking the case to trial. 
um, you know, turns out that the, the, the contractor, the contractor was right. The contractor won at trial. And um, by then the damages uh, had grown to, you know, 600 and some thousand dollars. And it was both a negligence claim and a breach of contract claim. So they were entitled to attorney's fees. So there was another $650,000 and, and there were all of the defense costs. So, you know, a, a case that could have settled for, you know, 250 or 300 or even $400,000 uh, two years earlier wound up costing, you know, close to $2 million to resolve. And, and yeah. um, you yeah, know, and that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. And a lot and that, of time and energy. And that happens all too, too often when, you know, and that, that's kind of what I was getting at. Like when you have those cases that you, you're looking at and you're like, okay, um, you know, the damages might be terrible, um, but liability doesn't look terrible, <laughs> but costs look awful. So, you know, maybe we sit down now before you even file a complaint and see if we can somehow come to a meeting of the minds that prevents plaintiff from wasting, you know, or spending money prevents us from spending, you know, all these costs and experts and whatever it may be, um, and try to get this resolved before, you know, it balloons up. Because then it gets to a certain point that, you know, you might be able to resolve on day one for X, just like that case. And now you're on, you know, day 565 and you're triple. <laughs> Yeah, no, that that that's exactly right. And, and you know, like Trisha, Trisha suggests, um, you may not have all the answers, and you may have to make some assumptions. Um, you know, but uh, you know, but you have to be comfortable knowing that you know, um, with those assumptions, you're probably getting a better outcome. Um, you know, than you would if you you know, spent the time and energy to to you know confirm all of the answers and. Yeah. You may not confirm all of the answers. I mean, there's there's often times where you're still going to wind up with, you know, the light was green, the light was red at, at, at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah, and I think um, I, I talk about this a lot that you know, while there are, there are occasions that you may not you may want to keep unturn every stone along the way. It isn't necessary to unturn every stone, overturn every stone along the way. You can figure you can pretty much figure it out where where you need to be and what you need to do to get to where you need to be without that process. Right, right. And I guess going back to the way one goes into the process, if, you know, if, if one side approaches the other um, and says, look, do you think that there's any way that we can explore early resolution? I think we're both, we're both working towards the same goal here. We want to find, you know, what, what's a reasonable, you know, settlement um, for this case, if we possibly can. Or, or if we can't find out why not, where, where are, are the distinctions? Where, where are the key disagreements, right? And um, maybe let's focus on those and then either come back together and see if we can't come to a solution or not spend a bunch of time, you know, fighting and doing litigation about things where we, where we might agree or that we decide might not matter, but, um, you know, reduce the costs. Yeah. And even if you can reduce the costs and just have one issue or, or, or a couple of issues um, you know, resolved by, you know, an arbiter at the end, um, you know, that one, the relationship's going to be better and you're going to save, save, you know, time and money, um, which, you know, benefits the process as well. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think there's nothing that bothers a client more than spending needless money. <laughs> like, they don't want to do that. They just, they, yeah, they, they don't want to spend money on silly things when that money can be used towards resolving it or, or, you know, something more useful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Music to my ears. I agree a hundred percent. So, you know, after being in this business, uh, in the mediation business business for some years, you have to have had some interesting scenarios that, you know, maybe interesting settlement, uh, agreements or mediations gone, gone awry. Um, I don't know if you're able to share any, some of those experiences without naming specific, specific names. <laughs> well, I certainly can't name specific names. Um, and I don't know that I, you know, can, can get into too much specific detail even, um, because that might sort of g give away, you know, which case it might've been, but, um, you know, 
I mean, one of the things I love about them is that they're all different, right? Like we even okay. even um, when we're litigating, we say, you know, yes, every case is different. You know, you may go through the same steps and the same processes, but but every every plaintiff is a different person. Um, you know, um, most of the time, every you know the, the defendants are are, are different, um, and, and so they're they're all unique in, in that respect. But um, you know, I, I've had some recently. So online certainly allows us the ability yeah. to talk with people um, remotely more easily. Um, uh, you know, I, I had a case with somebody who was um, in a foreign country, and so we have to, you know, talk with them in in the evening, given the time differences or what have you. But um, you know, using it, and you, but they speak foreign language, mm -hmm. um, and and th that makes things difficult, even with a translator. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I'm giving a very good answer to your question. It's hard. It's hard <laughs> to get in. It's I, you know, I guess for me, it's hard to. Um, what, think of anything in particular and, and then and generalize it. Well, how, how about how about I frame it a little bit differently? Have, since th this influx of online mediations, I'm sure you've had your fair share of, you know, as we all have, seeing things happen in the background or to the side <laughs> that um, may be more interesting than just, you know, the, the plain black background or white wall. <laughs> You get a lot of, of interesting angles, that's for sure. The looking up, you know, people's noses and um, <laughs> sometimes people are using phones instead. And But, you know, um, I don't get too many people driving and those sorts of things that, you're, that they're not supposed to be doing. So that's, um, that, that's part of the process of, of, of working with the parties in advance of the mediation is making sure that, you know, that their setups are good. Um, that they're going to be in a, in a comfortable spot, that they've got the right technology um, and, and, you know, that they're in a setting um, that kids aren't going to be running around in the background and, and, you know, but, but you get that occasionally. Now, what advice do you give or would you give to um, parties coming in into a mediation with you or any, any other mediator to, to make sure you're putting your best foot forward to at least give your best effort to get the case resolved. Patience. That's good advice. Um, yes. Let you know you, you have to go through the dance. Let 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 the process work. Um, and you know, be reasonable. I think come come in um, with a reasonable starting point. You know, anchoring is important, and I think can be helpful. Um, but, but don't let the anchor tank, take the whole ship down. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, if, if, if you've got a case that you anticipate, you know, you'd be happy with $50,000 at the end of the day as a plaintiff, you know, don't start at a million dollars. Um, and, and at the same time on the defense side, you know, if, if you know, you're going to pay thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, don't start at $500 or don't start at $1,500. And, um, I think, Oftentimes that's where the process stalls and, and winds up leading to protracted, um, you know, disputes and, and, and litigation, because that sends the message that there's really um, no hope yeah. of, of a settlement. And um, the biggest um, instigator to, to, to settlement um, is um, the, the notion, the, the, the notion that a settlement is possible. Right? Yeah. So the, the biggest instigator to movement um, by either side is the anticipation that the case can settle. So, you know, when you have these extremely polarized, um, you know, positions, it, it's just hard for people to see how that's possible. And so you have, you have to get them to a point where they feel that you know they can get close enough to get something done. Yeah, I will say there's nothing frustrates me more than being in a mediation and just doing matching movements. Like, oh well, you came up five, so I'm only going to go down five, and then it's like, okay, like someone has to eventually give up, <laughs> give up their their position that I'm only going to move X because you only moved Y. Um, but I, I can see that has stalled. I've been in so many mediations that stalled the process because everyone just gets frustrated and it's like, this isn't going anywhere. Whereas in reality, 
I think we all have an idea of where the case should end up. And we, both of us might be unwilling to get there. Um, but by kind of doing those silly movements, just because the other person side is doing those movements, it drives me insane. I must drive mediators insane. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, one, one, um, tactic I'll employ is, is, uh, I'll tell parties to ignore what the other side is doing. I mean, you know, you, you have some idea of where, you know, you'd like to be at the end of the day. Um, you probably have some sort of plan to get there. Just stick with that. Um, and that often then encourages the other side to do the same. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of overthinking when sometimes when you're in the room, you're like, well, if I do this, they must think I'm going to do this. And there is a certain amount of psychology to it, of course, but I think there's a, an also an element of overthinking the, the psychology behind it to try to like trick the other side about where you might be going next. Yeah, absolutely. There can be, but you know, that that's part of going through the process too, right? Is, is you, you want to explore all your options and, and make sure you're not giving anything up. And um, you know, that's what they're, that's what, that's what they, that's what we're there for. <laughs> so <laughs> fun twister. <laughs> So, you know, sitting here today, uh, after go going through, you know, your career as a litigator and now as a mediator, if you were to do it all over again, uh, would you choose this path or would you choose a totally different career? Uh, oh, I would absolutely choose this path. I mean, um, I love mediating. I love, um, you know, genuinely helping parties um, resolve their, their problems, um, you know. When I came out of law school, you know, nobody started mediating, um, you know, early or as a career, as a first career. Um, now you see that to some extent. Um, and, you know, I think that's fantastic. Um, so, you know, maybe I would have started it earlier had I known that that really was a possibility. But, but I certainly wouldn't change where I'm at now, now in any respect. Well, and I do think you're, you're, Ex professional experience prior to going to mediation serves you well into being a, a better mediator. I, th I think ha having, you know, being a litigator and walking the walk helps you understand everyone's positions a little bit better. At least that's yeah. my opinion. <laughs> no, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if you want to be in a certain area, it's absolutely helpful to have knowledge of, of that arena. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on. Can you let, let our um, listeners know how they can find you should they, they need your services or just want to reach out and connect to you? Yeah, sure. Um, you can certainly find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me at rosenresolution.com um, or email me at jason at rosenresolution.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on. It was a pleasure chatting with you. I, I love talking mediation and every, uh, strategies for mediation and just, you know, I, I, and I think as most claim people in claims and attorneys do, I think it's one of the more fun parts of our job. So thanks so much for sharing, sharing your thoughts on it. Well, my, my, my pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, I'll always um, love when People like talking about mediation, consider mediation. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody further. Great. And for all um, our, my listeners and people watching out there, you could please like and subscribe to The Defense Never Rests on Apple Podcasts. And you can also find us on YouTube at The Legal Navigator. Mm -hmm.